Hi, and welcome to another edition of Studio 411. I'm your host, Larry De Silva. Well, we've got a real treat for you today. We've got uh, well-known country singer Lacey J. Dalton joining us from uh, Nevada via the telephone. Uh, Jay, uh, Lacey, rather, uh, of course, uh, first hit the country top 40 in 1979 with a song she wrote called Crazy Blue Eyes. Uh, uh, Lacey was one of the most, uh, or has been one of the most successful female vocalists in the country format uh, during the 80s and 90s. Uh, such hits as Take It Easy, Hillbilly Girl with the Blues, uh, Everybody Makes Mistakes, uh, Black Coffee, as well as the uh, CMA-nominated anthem, which is probably her most recognizable song called 16th Avenue. And Lacey uh, is still out uh, performing all over the, uh, the West Coast, Middle America, and she's got a new CD to talk about, a CD called Scarecrow, actually uh, an EP CD. Uh, and we welcome to Studio 411, Lacey J. Dalton. Welcome, Lacey. How are you? Thank you, Larry. I, I couldn't be better. Um, uh, sitting up here, uh, it's a beautiful day. It's kind of hot, actually. I'm in the mountains above Reno near the old town of Virginia City, about 6,500 feet. And the dogs and I are just here. Uh, we're kind of kind of sitting back at this afternoon because it's pretty hot. We did some work earlier this morning, and we'll do some work er uh, later on this evening. But right now, we're uh, in the perfect mood to have a conversation with Larry De Silva. <laughs> Very nice. And right. friends. And friends. Absolutely. Now tell me, uh, uh, tell me about how the uh, the uh, idea the, for the uh, Scarecrow uh, EP came about. Larry, I had uh, I have a, a wonderful I had a wonderful friend of fifty years uh, named Barry Wilson, and um, she heard some of these songs. I'd written some songs. I had a long marriage of about twenty years. And I was with my business manager. Uh, he had become, he had worked his way up through my business to become the manager of the business. And I really thought when we uh, were uh, breaking up, I really thought that because he was my business manager, he might give me the business. And in fact, he gave me the business. <laughs> and I was devastated. I was um, just my heart blew into it, smithereens. This was someone I really trusted and worked with very, very closely. He was a fabulous sound engineer, and he had actually engineered my first uh, independent CD, which I was I made in uh, I made the first version of it in 2003, and later in 2006 I made a, a CD called The Last Wild Place Anthology, which <laughs> just this year uh, the Strictly Country Magazine and the Spirit Awards said was the best CD of 2019. This 13 year old record, and uh, and they also uh, said that the song uh, Boundless Skies, which I w wrote the lyrics for. Um, was the best well-written song of 2019. So uh, he was a he was a wonderful partner and a wonderful engineer. But when he left, he gave me the business. So I had to start over, and I was I was absolutely destroyed emotionally and financially in every way you can imagine. And out of that experience came the songs Earthquake and Scarecrow. I was going to say that that story reminds me of uh, some old Jerry. Uh Jerry Reed tunes, uh, the one I remember, uh, uh, she got the gold mine and he got the shaft, only the genders yeah, were the genders was, were reversed in this case. Sort of the reverse of that, <laughs> yes, it was, sort of was. But, you know, I wrote the song Scarecrow about uh, 12 or 13 years ago, and I could not even sing it until last year. And I played it for this friend of mine, and she has passed since, my dear, dear friend of almost, well, 50 years, almost 50 years. She, um, she said, you know, I, I, I'm going to have my friend. I have a friend I went to school with, and his name is Ira Ingber. And he has produced, you know, Bob Dylan, and he had Bob Dylan's band, and he's done a lot of work with a lot of Bonnie Raitt and a lot of really great people. And I, he's just a wonderful person. He needs to hear this music. So she got him a plane ticket and brought him up to, I was playing in Watsonville, California, at a benefit for my Wild Horse Foundation. And he came up and saw me, and he heard those songs. And he said, I want to do this. I want you to come to L.A., and I want to produce these songs. So I went to L.A., and we produced Scarecrow uh, and another song called Earthquake. And um, actually, there are only four songs on the CD. I wrote a song for a very dear friend of mine called You Cannot Tell Your Heart Who to Beat For. And because she was going through exactly the same kind of 
experience, which the only thing I can describe, when you've been with someone that long and you love and trust that person pretty implicitly, and there is this betrayal, it just sends your heart into smithereens. Absolutely. There's another song, correct me if I'm wrong, that we're going to hear later on called Life's About Now. Is that now also from the Scarecrow uh, EP? It is from the Scarecrow yeah, EP. I love that. It's my, that's, uh, my favorite song of, of the, oh, they're all great, but I'm telling you, I, that, that's my favorite of the, uh, of the EP. As I heard that and I said, oh, we definitely have to uh, have that and we're going to hear it uh, at the end of the show. But, uh, oh, I'm so, I'm so glad you like it. You know, I, I started it as a, an experiment. I wanted to see if Ira and I, we worked together really well. And I said, Ira, I have this song started. And I want to see if you and I can write together, because if we can write together, we can probably really have a blast. So we wrote Life's About Now in the studio while we were recording the EP. And when we finished it, we, we, we finished it up and, and put it on the, the, um, the end of the EP as the last song. And we like to think of it as our Viagra commercial. There you go. <laughs> in fact, we're, tra we're trademarking it right now because we think life's about now. So the first thing we thought was, how about a Subaru? Buy a Subaru because life's about now. There you go. So you see, she's already mapping out all the possibilities. They're right there. Oh yeah. Well yeah. And then my my graphics person that does all my graphics work and has produced me in the past, he said. It sounds more like a Viagra commercial. Oh. I thought, you're absolutely right. Life's about now, Viagra. Now, give Ira a mention. Ira, I know uh, from reading the notes, uh, he's, uh, he's worked with some pretty, uh, some pretty good people in his time. He, Ira is, uh, is a magnificent musician. He um, comes from a musical family. He has uh, you know, all kinds of street cred. Uh, just everyone I ever have. Oh, dear. That's my dog going off at a some sort of. There you go. I think I think he's vocalizing another a new song on the horizon. There, there you, you go. You know, Carl, the Christmas song. Yes. Carl, yeah. Carl, <laughs> Carl, please. Wow. <laughs> okay. Well, I love dogs. Yeah. And uh, that was Carl. He wanted his moment of his two minutes of fame because his song, Carl, the Christmas Dog, which you can watch for free on YouTube. There's a video. Uh, was also called by Strictly Country Music and the Spirit Awards as the Christmas Song of the Year for 2019. It, it is a great video, I must say. I, I've had the privilege of seeing it. Yeah, Carl. We had Carl, so much. Carl deserves an award for that. <laughs> well, Carl's impossible now. He's impossible to live with. You know, between the Crystal Bowl and the Ascot, and, and I mean, it's uh, the Cape. It's a. Uh, it's it's been hard. His his head. He, he got a little. It, it just. A little full of himself, you there know, you after go. all the, the attention. I think he was just trying to put his in, two cents in <laughs> during this interview so people would know uh, and recognize him as Carl the dog. He's forever emblazoned in our memories, believe me. Uh, Lacey <laughs> Isn't that a terrible sound he makes? <laughs> Sounds like the hound of the Baskervilles. Lacey J. Dalton joining us along with Carl for the hour here on Studio 411. <laughs> for more information, uh, our website www.laceyjdalton.com. Dot com and uh, she mentioned a few minutes ago about musical family you yourself came from a musical family uh, growing up uh, part of your life in Pennsylvania I believe I did I grew up in a little town called Bloomsburg Pennsylvania and my mother and dad and sister all played country music and it's all I ever heard besides uh, Perry Como uh, it, growing up I mean it, I never heard anything in the house but that and um, when I finally, being the unmusical one, decided to pick up a guitar at the tender age of 17, um, I, you know, I kind of um, was a black sheep. I kind of strayed from the, from the fold and played folk music. And I got very, very interested in the music of Joan Baez and Bob Dylan and Judy Collins and then Roots music. Um, you know, like uh, Lightning Hopkins and Lead Belly and, you know, that black roots music. Do you know country music came from the black music, that roots music that the black people brought from Africa, combined with the uh, Celtic music, the, the, uh, the music of the Appalachians, all the, the uh, Irish, Welsh, and Scottish folks that came to, uh, came to work in the coal mines. And that music combined to create both country music and bluegrass. That is the origins of that music. And I started, um, go, I kind of went backward from country music back into those forms 
And then when I was 21 years old, uh, there was this handsome guitar player at the Bloomsburg County Fair, and I was selling jewelry for Big Joe Ryan, and I looked across the way, and selling psychedelic posters was this handsome guy. And uh, we met and liked each other and ran off to California and formed a psychedelic rock band and lived in a commune. So that was, uh, that was how I got away from Bloomsburg, Pennsylvania, and that is how I got to the West Coast. And I happened to land in a town that has a fabulous music college. Santa Cruz, California has a college called Cabrillo College where a lot of people get a wonderful musical education. And I always say about Santa Cruz that there were more musicians there than people. So you really had to, you had to really refine your craft to even work. Because, uh, and of course, even when you did work, and I worked almost every day of the week back then, you only made, oh, the very most you ever made was maybe $100 a night. That was a big night. We made for, for as much as... Uh, or as little as ten dollars a night to fifty dollars a night, seventy five dollars a night. This is for four hours of music. Wow, a lot of sets, so, a lot yeah, of sets. And, and it was very competitive. <clears throat> you really had to grow, and you had to be good. There, there were the likes of Neil Young and the Doobie Brothers and Santana. All these folks were right around there, and played locally there in Santa Cruz. There was a place called the Catalyst where I worked every Wednesday night, and every big act in the world came to the Catalyst. All kinds of music, not just country music, not just rock and roll, not just folk music, but um, reggae and uh, some very unusual forms of music from Africa and um, from other parts of the world. I remember there was a concert. I heard a Paraguayan harp player in a church there, and it was some of the most beautiful music I'd ever heard. So I had a lot of influences on my music, which is why when I went to Nashville, they had no idea what to do with me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was just, I was just, I was, it was really different. But Billy Sherrill, who was my first producer, I got signed to CBS Records. Um, and Billy happened to be my first producer, and he was the most wonderful man. He is the person responsible for uh, George Jones and Tammy Wynette and Tanya Tucker and Ray Charles. He was Ray Charles, a producer almost to the end of his life. He, um, he was just, he produced a lot of different people like David Allen Coe and, and Johnny Paycheck, Charlie Rich. There were a lot of different types of people that he produced, but he always taught. He wanted me to change my name so that I sounded like an outlaw. We have an image of Billy uh, of, up on the screen, Billy on the right, Billy Sherrill. Uh, and then in the middle there, a young, younger Willie Nelson. And uh, when I dug this photo up, and then on the far left, uh, uh, we have a very young and a lot of hair on this young man, Jimmy Buffett on the far left. Downtown. Oh. That is something else. I don't remember him with long hair. Do oh, you have? yeah, I saw him in 1977 on the Hotel California tour. Uh, he opened for the Eagles, and that's my that was my my Jimmy Buffett one and only time I've seen him. Unfortunately, I'm not a parrot head, but. I remember thinking. Boy, I sure am. I think his music is wonderful, and it just seems to stay happy. Oh, it is. It is good music. I'm just saying. Music, I'm not, I, really I don't like fall it. into that like deadheads. You know, that kind of almost uh, borders on obsession. I like it, but it just I've I never kind it. of embraced it completely. But but no, the music's very good, and and he uh, you know certainly made <laughs> made a few pennies in his lifetime. That's for sure. <laughs> well, so did Billy Sherrill, and and I was very grateful to have him as my producer, he said, uh, he always told me, he said, you know, I want you to find a name that sounds like an, because what brought me back to country music from the hinterlands that I had explored musically for many years were the outlaws. That's what made me love country music again. It was Waylon Jennings and Willie Nelson and Johnny Cash and Merle Haggard and Chris Christopherson and Guy Clark. They were writing about things that I thought were fascinating things. The Highwayman was about reincarnation. You know, um, Desperados Waiting for a Train was about two old men waiting to die. And they were talking about some very wonderful, there was some very wonderful poetry in that outlaw music. And that's what brought me back and allowed me to be in country music. And um, during that time, it was very unusual for a woman to open for the likes of Hank Williams, Jr., or even Willie, or even Merle. I mean, Merle had, I think, more women because he was had some partners who were, who were women. But it was it was very unusual, and I got to 
open those shows for those guys for long periods of time, usually about a year, year and a half um, with those folks. And um, at that time, I was also honored to be the only woman on the platinum uh, duet album that Willie had uh, called um, Half, Half, Nelson. Half Nelson. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. that was a great album. I mean, it had Ray Charles, and it had Leon Russell, and it had Santana, had Merle Haggard, had Julio Iglesias. I mean, there were a lot of incredible uh, people on that, and I have a gold record from it hanging on my wall. Um, and it, it was uh, probably one of the the really high spots in my career. Later on, you know, when I... Um, in 1992, I had my last big hit, Black Coffee, and I became then an independent artist, which is why many of your listeners think I'm deceased. <laughs> However, <laughs> I am not. Far, far from it. We'll, we'll pause you there. <laughs> but uh, we've got a, a live, actually, a live performance of uh, Lacey, along with some of her uh, musical cohorts. Uh, we've got uh, a uh, cut of the title track of the EP, Scarecrow, uh, and we will check that out, and then we'll be back with more Lacey J. Dalton here on Studio 411. Enjoy.
And back here on Studio 411 with uh, Lacey J. Dalton, our guest, uh, uh, new EP, Scarecrow, LaceyJDalton.com. I wanted to mention, too, because, again, this is really impressive, uh, 20 top 40 country hits. Nine of those were top 10 hits. So, again, and actually the first time I think I saw you, I, I, I saw, remember this when I saw the clip, uh, 1980, I saw you on American Bandstand with our... Uh, of course, uh, I, I feel like I know the man because so many people we've had on this show had some interaction with him with Dick Clark. So that must well, have he, been. He was he, what a sweetheart. You look like you were positively glowing on that. On that, uh, I saw the interview part because they don't show the the, the musical part because it's probably copyright uh, infringements. But oh. but they they show uh, um, uh, clips of the interview portions and you you just look like you were on top of the world and you had just won an award too on that. Uh, uh, for uh, your, one of your first songs, I believe, at that point in time. You know, that was a magical song. That I have a friend who's been my friend since I was seven years old. Her name is Mary McFadden, and she was at my house recovering from a divorce. And uh, she was up in my loft. I had a cabin in the Santa Cruz Mountains, and I had gotten up and put on a pot of coffee, and I was playing my guitar, and I had come up with this song. I was trying to write this song. And... Um, I had, you know, why do I fall for those something blue eyes? And uh, I said, Mary, <laughs> get up and come down here and have a cup of coffee with me. I said, you're in the perfect, she was recovering from a divorce. She was in the perfect mood to write this song with me. So we wrote this song together. Now, keep in mind, we were best friends for our whole lives until this point. And I think we were probably about 30 years old, 32, 33 years old at the time. And we wrote this song, Crazy Blue Eyes, and the original title was Letter to Mama, but it became the song that started Lacey J. Dalton in 1979, and it was an amazing song because it was a different kind of a song for a woman to sing at that time. Uh, it was a pretty liberated song um, about, you know, falling in love with uh, <laughs> with uh, men who could not possibly maintain a relationship. Uh, probably because you yourself didn't want to maintain a relationship, so it was a, it was a different uh, it was a kind of a different um, take. And I always had a little bit different stance. I uh, remember they always wanted me to sing songs about divorce. Well, but your producer, right? He was very uh, uh, well known as a probably writer as well as producer for Tammy Wynette back in the day. So that that's probably where some of that came from. Well, it, I think it certainly was, and they wrote, you know, D I V O R C, which I hated. And I told Billy that. <laughs> he said, "Well, I've hated it all the way to the bank." There you go. Yeah. But he wanted. They wanted me to sing those types of songs, and uh, I'll never forget. There was a song that went. I dropped your name in Chicago. It's legally changed. Starting tomorrow, I said, Billy, I don't want to sing that song. <laughs> I said, I don't care about divorce. I don't believe in divorce. I just, you know, it happens. It's a horrible thing. I don't want to sing about it. Well, here we come, full circle, and the new EP, Scarecrow. That song was about a 20-year marriage that ended in a very bad betrayal. And I have found the most amazing thing about Scarecrow is that I've been playing to a lot of different types of audiences. And I was up not long ago in Washington. And this has happened about six or seven times since I released a song in January. I'll be in the middle of my show and I'll do the song Scarecrow which is not country. I don't know what you call it. The, the, I thought it was Americana, but the president of the Americana Association told my manager that I was not middle of the road enough for Americana. Wow. And, you know, that this song was too far out. Well, in the middle of my shows, people, this was a Western audience that I was playing at, in Clarkson, uh, Washington, and that whole audience stood up and clapped for about two or three minutes. In the middle of the show, with a song they'd never heard before, so whatever it is, whatever I went through to have to write that song, and like I told you before, I wrote it a long time ago, about 12 or 13 years ago, and could not sing it until about a year ago. Just could not, couldn't sing it. It was just too close to, it hurt. 
so um, it has it has that that kind of thing going. But but back in those days, I didn't want to sing about divorce, and I didn't want to sing about that stuff. I wanted to sing about. I wrote a song called "Adios and Run." That's about uh, two comancheros. You know, they steal from the white man. You know, and sell go. You know, go across the border and sell it to the Mexicans, and then come back and. Uh, steal some more stuff, and they, you know it's the end of their lifetime. And uh, it's about it's about these two uh, these two old Indian outlaws that have made their uh, well not so old, but they've made their uh, living by stealing. And and it's the uh, they're one of them is shot, and he's dying in the desert. And it's the sort of conversation between the two of them. And I really, those are the kinds of songs like uh, Pancho and Lefty or Desperado by the Eagles. Those kinds of songs were the songs, those songs of the New West that had a little bit different and more poetic feeling to them. That's what brought me back to country music. That's what I loved were, you know, Chris Christopherson and Willie Nelson, Waylon Jennings, Guy Clark, that bunch of guys. Well, th th those people you're mentioning, and I, and I know this would apply to your music, is that, you know, country western of the 70s and backwards, a lot of, a lot of twang, which again is not bad in, in small dosage, but, you know, I, and you saw it even in the 80s, uh, a lot of people said country music uh, performers sold out, became a little much uh, too mainstream or too top 40, but I think it was a progression because they were trying to break away from from that old style, and I'm just going to use some examples. Uh, no disrespect to them, you know, Buck Owens or uh, you know, uh, uh, people that that just everything had like uh, uh, too much twang, if if that makes well, any you, sense. You, it, it, that was a classic thing, you know. It was, uh, and some of that I think is fabulous. Uh, Lefty Frizzell had a style that was so unique to Lefty Frizzell, and actually uh, Merle Haggard. Did, used to just rave and talk about how much he loved Lefty and how Lefty taught him how to sing. And, and Merle had a twang. George Jones had a twang. A lot of them, I, I did a, a tribute CD, an independent CD uh, called Here's to Hank that was a tribute to Hank Williams Sr. And that included some of those strange vocalizations that he did. That I, I'm not sure I love those vocalizations, but they certainly are unique and I thought it would be fun to kind of carry them forward for people who had never heard them. Absolutely. So I, I did them. And um, it, it's so funny because now I am considered, I'm considered a very traditional country person. But I certainly wasn't when I was in country music at that time. Uh, country music had gone very traditional. Uh, I think Ricky Skaggs was sort of the the big thing and we had wonderful singers i don't know i think there's a place for everyone's music sure. in the world i think there's uh i don't really uh, love a lot of it but i really did love the outlaws and i still do i just hope willie nelson lives to be about 190 years old there I just you think go. he's great i just read a book called the Tao of willie where he's talking about his philosophy and he's a very deep spiritual person uh, and he cares about the earth, and he cares. He's gone to Congress twice to plead for the lives of the wild horses. This is Willie, the Willie Nelson that that I know. Um, not that I know Willie very, very well, but he and Snoop Dogg saved the largest uh, uh, contiguous wild horse, horse herd in the country up here because I called them and asked them to please do a public service announcement to say that our Department of Agriculture here in the state of Nevada was going to take these horses to slaughter. And there was no reason at all. They were in a place where they weren't in competition with cattle. There was plenty to eat and drink. The department had put out a thing in the newspaper and said they were starving and there wasn't any water and they were sick. And every single one of those things was a flat, bald, just a lie. And uh, I went to the press and told the uh, the press that it, these things were not true, and we had the facts to f and the figures to prove it. And then nothing happened. And I, <laughs> I called Willie, and uh, I said, Willie, I had just, I sent you a public service announcement. Can you please do it in your voice and put it on the satellite? And he said, Lacey, I can't. I'm in the studio this morning, and I'm leaving for Amsterdam. Uh, first thing in the morning. 
and I'm in the studio today. But what he did, I said, well, Willie, it would be so much better. He said, I'll let, put it out in your voice, and I'll, you know, I'll tell people that I am endorsing it. And I said, that is wonderful, and if you could possibly do it in your own voice, it would be so much more powerful. Lacey J. Dalton joining us here for the hour on Studio 411. For more information, LaceyJDalton.com, the EP Scarecrow. Uh, we've got a clip that uh, we want to run uh, just to give me a little thumbnail on the uh, Let It Run Foundation. Obviously, you've talked already a little bit about it, uh, but again, uh, uh, share with the audience again. Uh, uh, well, just to, just to quickly finish my story, sure. uh, Willie Nelson went to Amsterdam, and he and Snoop Dogg both did a PSA. Oh, nice. The Virginia Range Wild Horse Herd, which is uh, arguably the largest contiguous private herd on private lands in the country. There are bigger herds in uh, on Indian reservations. But we formed in 2003, we formed the Let em Run Foundation. And what I do with that foundation is I raise uh, my group and I raise money to uh, give the boots on the ground folks that don't have time. They're so busy rehabilitating horses and rescuing horses from slaughter that they don't have time to make the money to pay for all that. And it's a very expensive proposition. And so we, that's what we do. We raise, we raise money for people that we know that are boots on the ground who are really doing the work and are really, they're not doing it for ego reasons. They're not doing it because they want to be famous. They're doing it because they love the animals. And we're very careful about who we give that money to. There we go. That's the setup. Well, it's here. We've got a wonderful video with Lacey and uh, some beautiful horses called Let Them Run. We'll uh, watch this and be back with more on uh, Studio 411 with our guest, Lacey J. Dalton. Up in Story County where the wild ponies run. The gold was mine that fueled the Civil War. There's a fierce but friendly people, and if you ask them to a one, they'll tell you there's still a lot of things worth fighting for. Up in Story County, the Mustang still runs free. Eagles soar above the pinion pine. And we know these horses stand for something that is precious and more rare than all the silver and the gold from them old mine. Let them run. Let them wild bodies run. Don't you brand them. Don't you break them. Don't you let the killers take Let them 
run Back on Studio 411 with our guest singer-songwriter Lacey J. Dalton. I wanted to turn again, you have worked and you mentioned already so many folks. Uh, uh, we had a clip earlier of uh, you with Merle Haggard. I just read a survey recently where, um, you know, the survey actually had him as number one, like, all-time country sing uh, singer. And again, I, I don't know if it was based on record sales or whatever. They're, they're all subjective, but I thought that's pretty impressive to be even in the top ten. But you know, you, you obviously worked with the man, knew the man a little bit, and uh, that must have been quite, a, quite an honor to uh, even be in the same room with a, with a gentleman like Merle Haggard. You know, Merle was, um, Merle was, and, and uh, these, I call these guys old soldiers. People like Merle and Willie and Waylon and Johnny Cash, they really know who they are. When you look in their eyes, they know who they are. There's no mistaking it. And all of them, to a person, were, were very, very, very kind to me. If we had time, I'd tell you a story about Merle and my mother that would touch your heart. But he, he really has a, he had a place in his heart for women, and uh, he was wonderful to work with, and I got to spend quite a bit of time with Merle. Another guy that uh, early on I saw a clip from 1990. It was a television show you were on with Larry Carlton, the guitar player. You were singing, uh, I think it might have been Black Coffee, one of your, your early 90s hits. And uh, across the stage from you was uh, a very young Vince Gill. Uh, tell me, it uh, uh, must have been quite a, a thrill to see that gentleman become the uh, major star that he has become. Oh, he, you know, Vince Gill is the, is the kindest, um, most humble person in the world. He is just, uh, I haven't seen him for a long time, but I just always loved him. And uh, he's so talented. It, and it's wonderful when somebody that talented and really that humble gets to be the biggest thing in show business. He deserved it. A couple of people. Uh, one, one I knew that you had recorded a duet with. The other one I did not know. Uh, both have left us. But we'll start with the one that, uh, that I did know that you had recorded with, uh, Glenn Campbell. Uh, people, of course, know Glenn for you know, being the tremendous singer that he was. What a lot of people don't realize was what a tremendous guitar player that he was. Oh, he was a fantastic guitar player, and I'll never forget. I went in to record with him, and he was, he was lying on like a psychiatrist's couch. <laughs> he was lying flat out with the microphone hanging down. I said, Glenn, what in the world? What are you doing? He said, well... He said, I just get better, I just get a better sound from the diaphragm by lying on my back. So we, everything we recorded, he recorded lying down on his back. And, and probably could still play a mean guitar even even doing so, I have no, no doubt. <laughs> well, he, he was recording vocals at that time, but yes, he could really play. Now, a gentleman that uh, I was surprised because I, I didn't know of any connection with him, and uh, hopefully I'll impress Lacey by digging up this chestnut. You recorded a song with the legendary Carl Perkins. Oh, you know, that was, a, that was a song that Carl Perkins wrote. I was so honored. It's such a good song. I still use it in my shows. It's called Restless. And um, uh, being in the studio with Carl was so fun. He was, um, he was also a very humble, very, uh, very sweet person, very lovely person to be around. And uh, it was really sad because neither one of us really sang harmony very well, so we just kind of traded things. We just kind of, you know, traded things off. But we had a good time doing it, and uh, it's still a song that I use in my show and I like a lot. It was a great, great recording of the two of you. Um, you know, it's funny, when uh, as we're doing the interview, I'm looking at my notes, and I said, okay, her first big hit was Crazy Blue Eyes. And then I thought, the question that I had was why you were... Uh, kind of labeled with this, well, uh, Lacey Dalton uh, has kind of a blue-eyed soul style. And uh, when I heard blue-eyed soul, I, I thought of like a pop group like Hall & Oates. You know, they always a blue-eyed soul. And then I thought, well, maybe it's because her first song was called Crazy Blue Eyes. But what exactly would blue-eyed soul mean to you? Well, it was probably things shining through from all the other types of music that I'd done. You know, I'd sung uh, quite a bit of blues. I had, uh, I had sung uh, f 
folk music. I'd sung some bluegrass. I'd done so, uh, you know, and it might have just been that, you know, when I sing, I try to sing songs that I can really feel. It makes it, it doesn't, I don't want to sing something. I, I have done it, but I'm, I'm not crazy about songs that I, I don't believe. I have, they almost have to be real to me. And so now that I'm independent, I don't have to do anything but that. And I think my performances are are very much enriched by the fact that, you know, each song is something that I really believe and feel. Now, do you find now over the last, we'll say, 10, 15 years, it appears to me that, and of course, now that you're recording independently, uh, this could be the main reason, um, it seems that you uh, feature almost exclusively songs that you have written or co-written back in the day, the Columbia, the Capitol record days, that didn't seem to always be the case. Would you say that that's a, a good assessment? Well, most of the first hits that I had were songs that I'd written, but then I had an, an inexperienced manager who kept me out on the road over 300 days a year for the first three years, and I really didn't have time to write, and I was really tired. I was very, I'll never forget after about the third year of just being on the road constantly, over 300 days a year. Willie Nelson and I were CBS's most active artists back then. And I got to my sister's house in Michigan and I was just exhausted. And I thought, you know, I might, I think maybe I hate country music. And I went down <laughs> into her basement and I wrote Hillbilly Girl with the Blues. That's yeah. where that song came from. There you go. Uh, changes, as I touched on earlier in the, the 80s and uh, continued on through the 90s uh, in kind of the musical tastes. And again, this is no ill reflection on some of these artists, but of course, Kenny and Dolly, you know, became very popular on the top 40 charts. You know, Juice Newton, you know, a lot of folks I could go on and on recorded marvelous stuff, but it seemed to create kind of a backlash in terms of the shall we say, more traditional establishment country folk? Well, I think that I think that's true. Country went kind of pop yeah. uh, then, and it certainly has become pop music now. Uh, but there's room for everybody. It's a big world. It's a big world. And if they won't let you, you know, be on the radio and they don't want you on the labels because they can't figure out who you are, there's a huge... Um, space out here. It's a wide open spaces and certainly the internet has allowed us to um, be much more creative. I'm so glad I'm not in some little corral of music anymore. I can write what spirit puts in me and I think music is a spiritual medium and I think when you lose touch with that you lose touch with what it really is about at least what it's about for, for me. I have to throw this in. Uh, I, I remember it came up even during the uh, the bandstand interview we, you did with Dick Clark. But uh, you had a, uh, shall we say, a, a singular movie career. You were in a, a movie that was uh, quite an interesting uh, flick uh, called Take This Job and Shove It. And it was based <laughs> on a country song that, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Johnny Paycheck sung it. I want to say David Allen Coe wrote it, if I'm not mistaken. Um, that, uh, I have to ask, what was it like working with some of the people? Uh, well, the one that comes to mind is, of course, Academy Award winner Art Carney. Did you spend any scenes with him or no? Actually, not, not with Art. Uh, I spent most of my time playing David Allen Coe's wife, which was hysterical. And uh, I actually had a couple songs that I'd written in that movie, one of them that Bobby Bear sang, uh, Beer Drinking Christian. And uh, Crazy Blue Eyes was also on the mm -hmm. soundtrack yeah. of that movie. So uh, that was because of Billy Sherrill, and I got to do a little uh, little part in the movie, and I don't know that. <laughs> I guess I must not have been very good, because I haven't been in any movies since. Well, it was, it was quite, a, uh, quite a lengthy cast, I got to say. I kept saying, how do they get all these people in this movie, like, you know, other than maybe for a minute here, a minute there, I got to tell you. Now, we have uh, a song, as I mentioned earlier, that, again, one of the, the tremendous tunes on the uh, Scarecrow EP, uh, Life's About Now. So, again, I think you, you kind of set the stage earlier that how that song came about. And, again, uh, do, do you get good response when you, you do that on your, uh, your stage appearances? <laughs> we do, and I don't do that song very much. It's, uh, it's a song, I wrote it in L.A. at sea level, 
and a lot of times I'm playing at 65, 7,000, 8,000 feet. Some of those vocal rides are pretty hard in the high altitudes, so um, I, I save that song for when I'm at sea level. I was going to say, yeah, make a note, low, normal altitude, uh, bring out... Uh, Life's about now, for sure. And and we'll be hearing that in a few minutes. Uh, uh, again, uh, just a tremendous, tremendous success that you've had. Uh, I had a chuckle there, the, the worldwide hit black coffee. Before we came on, we are talking about how we're both sipping on some coffee here. So I said, well, how apropos is that? So, But uh, again, uh, what, uh, uh, what's upcoming on the, uh, on the recording play for uh, Lacey J. Dalton? I'm sure you've got a lot of songs you'd like to get on, on vinyl, as they used to say. Well, you know, I probably have 30 or 40 songs that I haven't recorded, and um, I've just been so busy. I, I had a, a radio show for many, many years, and I also worked two days a week uh, up in Susanville, California, which is about 150 miles from here, in a level four prison teaching songwriting, and my guitar player, Dale, taught uh, guitar. And we worked there for the last three and a half. I, I stopped last uh, November. Uh, because it was just too much with this new record coming out. It was the best thing I've ever done in my life. It was so fulfilling. These guys in a level four prison are there from the time they're 17 years old, and they're probably uh, 40, maybe 45, 50, and, and, and younger. Uh, and they're in there for 20 to life. And I never had one moment of fear because they were so grateful. They hadn't had programming since the 80s when the recession hit. And they were so grateful to have these programs to learn new things. And uh, if I may say so, since I'm on the soapbox here, this is the most incarcerated country in the world. We have more people in prison here than they do in China. It is absolutely wrong. These people can be rehabilitated, and I'm here to tell you that I am 100% certain of that. Not all of them. Some of them are simply not. You, they just can't help it. They're just wired wrong. But a lot of them just had a bad start. Words of wisdom from our guest, country music legend Lacey J. Dalton. Uh, Entertainment Weekly once said of Ms. Dalton, no secular artist blends the spiritual and the physical as movingly or as profoundly as Dalton. And again, we appreciate her taking some time to join us, and we look forward to uh, having her back on the Studio 411 program. I want to hear that story about... Uh, her mom, and I think it was what, Merle Haggard you were talking about? So oh, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll have to have you back on for that. But in the meantime, we're gonna leave you with uh, the uh, clip for the uh, song, Life's About Now. Lacey, thanks so much for spending a few minutes with us. Thanks so much, Larry, it's been really fun. Hang in there with us, and we thank you for joining us here on this episode of Studio 411. Larry De Silva's my name, enjoy the video, Life's About Now. We'll see you next time, take care.